Thank all of you for leading us this morning and blessing us in this uh, hour of praise. It is good to see all of you today. Kaiden is sitting down here. Kaiden, you may be the toughest guy I know. Kaiden had a pretty extensive piece of surgery on Thursday, and he is uh, down here with his mom, and we're grateful that he's here and doing well this morning. You have your Bibles this morning, and we'll turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4 has five stories. It has two stories, the first and the fifth, which are stories about a little that became a lot. The people had a little, and it became extravagant. Then in the, uh, the second and the third stories are miracle stories. And then the fourth story is a story about the power of flour. And we'll get to that in a minute. But in the first story, there's a member of the company of prophets who has died. And his widow and her two, two, her two children come to Elisha and they say, Elisha, our prophet has died and he was deeply in debt. A man has come to our door and he is demanding that we pay him or telling us he's going to take us into slavery. And Elisha says, well, what do you have in your house? And she said, I, I have a little bit of oil in a jar. He said, send your children throughout the village and have them gather up every empty jar and every empty vessel they can find. So the two children spread out and they gather up every jar, every vessel, every pitcher, everything that they can find and they bring it into the house. And Elisha Elijah tells her, begin filling the jars of oil with the oil you have. And she starts pouring and she pours and she pours and she pours and she fills up all the empty jars. And when she has the last one full with oil, she tells her, she tells her son, bring me another jar. And he says, mama, there's not another empty jar in this village. And when the boy says that, the oil ceased to flow from the jar. She went to find Elisha. She said, I have filled up all of the jars. What do I do now? And he said, go and sell the oil you have and pay off your debts. That's the end of the story. She had a little. She spoke to the prophet, and it became a lot. Now, the second story is an interesting story because it's about the prophet's traveling habits. Elisha is going to and fro across the country, and he's stopping in the home of a wealthy couple, and he's having dinner and lunch from time to time. And the, the woman of the house gets the idea, well, let's, build an, let's build a room onto the house for the prophet when he's traveling. Nothing fancy, just a room, a bed, a chair, a table, and a lamp, a place where he can stay when he's traveling past. So one day, Elisha stops to have lunch with the couple. They show him the room. He goes into the room and he is marveling. It's a bed, a chair, a table, and a lamp. And Elisha says to the woman, he says, is there, is it, can I speak to the king on your behalf? She said, no, I live well among my people. He said, well, can I speak to the commander of the army on your behalf? She said, no, I live well among my people. Elisha turns to Giza. When the woman left, Giza's his assistant and he says, Giza? What is anything these people lack? And Jesus says, well, they don't have a child and her husband's old. So he says, call, call her back in. The woman appears back in the door of the add addition to the prophet's room. And she say, he says to her, he says, um, I'm going to give you a child. And she said, I didn't ask for that. Don't toy with me, she says. It's a, that's biblical language for saying, don't mess with me. <laughs> don't toy with me. And it says that the next season, they had a son. And that's the end of the second story. And a few years passed before the beginning of the third story. In the beginning of the third story, the son has grown and he has gone out to the field with his father where they are harvesting the wheat. And while they're in the field, the son suddenly comes down with a tremendous headache. And the scripture says he is laying, in the, laying beside the field, holding his head, saying, my head, my head, my head. 
And the father cannot comfort the boy, and so he sends a servant to gather him up, carry him home to his mother. He sits in his mother's lap, his mother's lap. She tries to comfort him, but at noon he dies. She takes him out of the kitchen and puts him on the bed in the prophet's room and lays him out. She calls for her servant and she says, bring me the speediest donkey, which I really don't know how speedy a donkey ever is. Bring me the speediest donkey. And she gets on the donkey and she takes off with all haste to go and find the prophet. And she finds Elisha and Giza on Mount Carmel. And he said, and they see her coming. And Elisha says, what do you think she wants? And Giza says, I don't know. She arrives in all haste. She jumps off off the donkey and he says, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she says, it is well. And then she falls down around his ankles crying. And she said, I told you, don't toy with me. My son has died. So Elisha turns to Giza and he says, Giza, you run ahead of us. You take my staff, you take it in where the boy is laying and you put my staff across his body and across his face. Giza goes and he does, he's instructed. And if he lays the staff on the boy, he comes back down the road to meet the prophet and the mother. And he says, he, Elisha, he's still dead. It didn't do any good. So Elisha arrives at the house and he goes into the prophet's bedroom where the boy is laying out and he crawls on top of the bed and he lays on top of the boy. And the scripture said he lays eye to eye, mouth to mouth, nose to nose, hands to hands. And he lays atop this boy and he begins to feel the boy warming up. Elisha gets up off of him, walks across the room, walks back into the bedroom, lays down on the boy again, eyes to eyes, nose to nose, mouth to mouth, hand to hand, and lays atop the boy. The second time he rises, the boy sneezes seven times and sits up on the side of the bed. Elisha opens the door and he calls for Giza and he said, go get his mother. And the mother comes in, and the boy is alive, and that's the end of the third story. The fourth story shows you that the company of the prophets does not eat very well. They're eating wild stew, stew made from wild herbs, wild vines, and wild gourds. And the stew has cooked all day long. It has been served before the prophets. And as they take the first bite of stew, somebody says, there is death in that pot. We can't eat this. And Elisha comes in the room and says, what's all the fuss? And they said, we can't eat this. There's death in the pot. And Elisha doesn't taste the stew. He just says, add more flour. So they threw more flour into the wild vines, the wild gourds, and the wild herbs. And it tasted better. And it was edible. And all the prophets ate the wild stew. That's the fourth story. Now the fifth story is our text for this morning. And it is the text. It is the final in the series of from a little to a lot. A man came from Baal bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. And he set it before them and they ate and had some left. According to the word of the Lord. The man from Baal shows up with his ties, 20 loaves of bread, and some other grains. And the prophet says to him, put it before the people to eat. And he said, there's not enough. There's a hundred people here. I didn't bring enough food for a hundred people. And the prophet said, put it before the people, let them eat, and there'll be leftovers. And the man did, and there were leftovers. 
Now, I've told you four stories and read the fifth story. But you'll notice in the telling of the stories and in the reading of the stories, the prophet never prays. The prophet didn't pray about the oil that was being dispersed to the widow and her orphan children. The prophet didn't pray about whether or not the rich woman should have a son. The prophet didn't pray about, the woman, about raising the son from the dead. The prophet didn't pray about putting a flower in the stew, and he doesn't pray here about having leftovers. The prophet never seeks the Lord's will. He never seeks the Lord's wisdom. He never seeks anything from the Lord. It is when the prophet speaks, the word of the Lord stands behind him, and it comes about. What Elisha does and what Elisha says always comes about because he is standing as an agent for the Lord. Now, a few moments ago, Nick Bammert, who Nick and Rennell are the newest grandparents in our congregation, by the way, having a little girl this week. All the details are in the worship guide. But Nick read a while ago from John chapter 6 about the feeding of the 5,000. It's late in the day. They can't disperse these people back into the villages and expect these villages to take on this many people and provide them food. Nor does anyone in the company of the disciples have enough money to feed all these disciples. So Jesus takes what they have, five loaves and two fish. And you notice the translation of which Nick read a while ago said that these were small loaves and small fish. And Jesus prayed over the food giving thanks he didn't pray lord i hope this works out he didn't pray lord i need your power to multiply this food he didn't pray lord i hope that this is the right thing to do instead as jesus broke the bread the power of god was behind him and it became dispersed to the crowd and everyone in the thousands of people ate and there was enough gathered up for 12 baskets when the power of the Lord stands behind the gift of food. There is a provision that comes in our lives. And food is always a gift of God. We may grow it in our gardens. We may grow it commercially in our fields. We may graze cattle. We may feed livestock. But the gift of food is always a gift from God. He allows us to be the stewards of it, but it always is a gift. Last month in June, the United States Department of Agriculture issued a report on the hungry people in this world. They say there are 782 million people who are currently living in food insecurity. 782 million people, and what they mean by food insecurity is, is they do not have enough food to live an active, healthy lifestyle that requires 2,100 calories a day. They have studied 76 countries that have historic need for food aid. Here are those countries. 39 of those countries are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Four of them are in North Africa. 11 of them in the North, excuse me, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And 22 of those countries are in Asia. India and Pakistan still remain among the 76 countries. And according to the United States Department of Agriculture, 21% of the people who live in those 76 countries are food insecure. They don't have 2,100 calories a day of food. But, they say, in the study, that over the next 10 years, that number will be reduced until there is only 446 million hungry people in the world. And the, department, the study from the U.S. Department of Agriculture says that food is going to become cheaper, that jobs are going to become better, and the economy is going to improve in these 76 countries enough that people are going to have jobs, make money, and be able to afford to buy the cheaper stocks of food in their countries. So, according to the United States Department of Agriculture, there are going to be fewer people, hungry people in the world 10 years from now than there are today because the economy is going to improve and they're going to be able to buy food. I, I 
hate to argue with government paid researchers who are much smarter than I am. But do you know what the number one cause of hunger in this world is? It's not distribution. The number one cause of hunger in this, in the world is conflict. War, civil war, terrorism, tribal conflict, regional battles. They are projecting there's going to be 330 million fewer hungry people in 10 years, but they can't project that war is going to stop. The number one cause of hunger in this world is conflict, and yet because the economy is going to improve, there are going to be fewer hungry people, but in many of these places, conflict is just a way of life. The second thing that the report doesn't take into account is weather. And we all know you can't predict famine and drought, too much rain, flooding. It's an optimistic report that maybe the economies will improve in these 76 countries and there'll be fewer need for hunger aid. But when it comes down to it with the conflict and the factor of weather, who really knows? And I think we all walk into very dangerous water when we start predicting. In the late 1940s, a team of agronomists funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Mexican Ministry of Agriculture brought together a group of agronomists in Mexico to try and see what could be done about the current strain of wheat and the damage that rust creates, that these disease of rust creates for wheat. And one of those people that they brought on to head the team was Norman Borlaug, grew up in Minnesota. And he went to, New Mexi to, went to Mexico trying to figure out how to make a better strain of wheat. And I'm going to save you a lot of details of the story, but he says in the first two years, he really wanted to quit. He said, I made a terrible career decision coming down here. But then they figured out how to cross strain the wheat and how to farm in the winter, uh, in the winter in the valleys and in the summers up on the mountains and able to do two crops in the same year with the cross strain. And they used 6,000 cross strains of wheat. And they developed a dwarf wheat that had a shorter stalk, but a thicker stalk. And with that thicker stalk, they could put a heavier grain of wheat on top and it would hold up. And they managed to make it resistant to rust. And this crop began to produce hundreds folds more abundant harvest. In the late 60s, Norman Borlaug and his team fought with the government of India and Pakistan to bring dwarf wheat into the country. By the mid-70s, the wheat harvest in India and Pakistan was more than 500 times what it had been before. And when Norman Borlaug died in 2009, it was estimated that he had saved the lives of one and a half to two billion people by the gift of food. We may play a role, we may be stewards, we may put the seed in the ground, we may water the crop, we may fertilize the crop, we may watch it grow, but food is a gift of God. When that widow died and her husband was in debt and that man is knocking on the door saying, I'm gonna take you all slaves unless you repay this debt. She had a little bit of oil and Elisha told her it'll never run out and they filled all the bottles up and it was a gift, a gift of the Lord. When the man showed up with his tithes and his offerings and he says, here, put the food before these hundred people. He said, there's not enough food. He said, there'll be enough and there'll be leftovers. It was a gift. Food is a wonderful gift that comes to us and the Lord allows us to participate and to be stewards. Ruth Hall told me this week 
you know, all Ruth is taking chemotherapy for bone cancer. And she takes another treatment next Tuesday. But I was out at the house this week and she said, Stacy, she said, my friends are bringing so much food out here. I am going to be the only person ever on chemotherapy to gain weight. <laughs> she said, it just comes. She said, they don't have a clue what they're doing for John and I in the blessing of food. Ronnie Black died about a month ago at five o'clock in the afternoon. Donna told me that when they got home and got things settled in the house, friends were already in Todd and Starla's house spreading out food across the kitchen counter. And she said at 7.30 we sat down and we had a wonderful meal with the friend, family and some friends. Food is a gift. We have that gift in our own church family. We serve meals to grieving families, lunch before or after the service, depending on the schedule. Kathy's the head of our hospitality committee. They start showing up about nine and setting tables and receiving food and heating up food and slicing desserts and filling glasses with ice and making tea and all the things that go with that. And then that family arrives at the appointed time and they start through the line and here are the comments I get. We live in the city. They don't do this in the city anymore. Oh, they may sit there and brag on their preacher who's on a billboard on the expressway somewhere. But they don't talk about their church providing that food in a time of need. Oh, they talk about fresh produce. Some will stand there and tell you about, this reminds me of my grandmother's black-eyed peas. Others will come through the line and they'll talk about the hard work required to put something like this together. And then from time to time, as Kristen sends out those emails, those emails go out beyond our church and our Pacific community, and they go, they go all over the West Texas. And I get emails back from ladies who are heading up committees in their church, and they say, how in the world do you all feed more than 100 people? Said so we never have a funeral meal in our church for more than 30. We wouldn't have a clue what to do if 100 or 150 people showed up. So I get a chance to write back an email that talks about the long tradition of this church. But you see, when someone passes, there's not a lot you can do. Oh, you can't jump in at the house and say, here, let me balance your checkbook. That, that might be helpful, but you're not going to do that. And you really need to know someone very well before you walk back to the back of the house and start doing their laundry. And most people are not comfortable cleaning other people's houses they may know casually. But you can bring that gift of food. In the name of the Lord, here is a blessing. I remember a funeral meal from my childhood. I'm still looking for it. It was the perfect cherry cobbler. It has not been duplicated, and in my mind, it may be so built up that it cannot be duplicated. But it was the perfect mixture of cherry filling and crust, a little more crust than filling. And it wasn't those sweet bean cherries, and I like those. And my wife, now that they're on sale, we have an ample supply of cherries at our house, of which I'm eating constantly. <laughs> But these were those West Texas cherries. These were cherries that were grown in West Texas that shouldn't be grown in West Texas because a cherry tree in West Texas has to fight for its life. These were those small cherries that were more tart than they were sweet. And this cobbler had that sweet tartness about it and the crust had been rolled out with just enough flour and it was thin and it was covered the pan and then the strips across the top with just the right amount of butter and the right amount of cinnamon. That was the perfect cherry cobbler of all time. And it happened at a funeral meal when somebody took the time to pick the cherries from the tree, pull the pits out, cook the filling 
roll out the dough, fill the pan with the dough and the dough with the filling and lace it across the top. It's a gift. It is a gift from God. Food is a gift from God. And we should be grateful every time we eat. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the stories from your scripture that remind us of your attention to the small things in our lives. The oil that never ran out till the last jar was filled. Reminds us, Father, of times in our own lives when we didn't think we could make it till payday, but somehow or another, by your grace, those dollars stretched out to the end. Father, we thank you for the times in our lives when we didn't think there'd be enough there was and there was leftovers. Lord, we thank you that these stories remind us of the gift of food. We thank you that you let us be stewards along beside you. We thank you that we get to put the seed in the ground. We get to water it. We get to fertilize it. We get to watch it grow. We get to harvest. We thank you, Lord, that you let us participate. But Lord, help us to always remember that what we eat is a gift from you. And Lord, in these war-torn countries where there's never enough, we pray for your peace so that your gifts may, may grow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our hymn of invitation today is Knowing You. We invite you to come forward this morning claiming faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Some of you looking for a church home, come and join with us this morning as we serve the Lord here. If you have a need in your life, you want to pray about that jar of oil is running thin. I'll be here. Let's pray together and seek the Lord. Let's stand and sing together.